can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Thomas LeMaguerre, and he is the CEO and co-founder of Republics. And Thomas, before I formally introduce you, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. And uh, we have a mutual friend, Jason Swank. He's been on the podcast twice. And um, the first time he talks about how he built up his agency to over eight figures and sold it. And... The next one he talked about was really about Republics and what you guys are doing, because I know he's um, involved and you guys collaborate on Republics. So everyone check those episodes out. And another good one is, um, you'll appreciate this one, Thomas, Todd Tasky I had on, he's got the Second Bite podcast. So what he does is he pairs private equity with agencies and helps sell agencies. And he finds sometimes they get more on the second bite than they do on the first, right? Because they sell the private equity and that private equity sells for a larger multiple because they built up more EBITDA. And that's actually what Thomas is doing and has done, which we'll go through that and many more on uh, inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the accountability, the strategy, and the full execution around a podcast. Thomas, we call ourselves the magic elves that work in the background to make it look easy for the host and the company. So they just run their company, develop great relationships, and produce great content. So for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com or email support at rise25.com. And I'm excited to introduce Thomas LeMaguerre. Uh, He's CEO and co-founder of Republics. Uh, They help clients in direct-to-consumer brands, dental clinics, BDB professional services, SaaS, And what they do is they help these companies generate revenue predictably. Who doesn't want to do that, right? They were the 14th fastest growing company in Canada with nine agencies in their group and over 32 million in revenues. Um, Most impressive thing, Thomas, is I'm not sure how you all do all this. You have six children, five boys and a girl. That's crazy, right? You look young too. So thanks for joining me. Thank you. It's great to be here. Let's talk about, um, let's just talk about Republics and what you do first, but I want to get into where this all started with I- Irrational, but talk about Republics for a second and, and what you do. Cause I know you were saying before we hit record, you have 25 services. Yes. And um, so Republics was built on a vision um, where the major problem is that growing a business is hard. And I know this as an entrepreneur, Jeremy, you know this, your listeners would know this as well. And one of the primary reasons for failure is a lack of growth. Now, so revenue solve a lot of these these issues. And so we came into the market saying, we want to go ahead and solve the revenue problem. And um, one of the big things that we focus on is how to deliver predictable growth, which is revenue and leads. Um, on a hassle-free basis. Because the other big issue is um, once you know what you need to do, which is a problem in itself, then you have to manage multiple agencies, vendors, and internal teams. Some work, some don't. And then you as the founder or the CEO or or the executive are now uh, mired in the details and not doing your job. So we said, we want to go ahead and handle that pain for our market. And we want to go ahead um, and make that growth experience easy, predictable, and hassle-free. And so that's been the mission for Republics. Your journey started with your agency before you grew. Talk about the initial idea for that, the first agency. So it it happened by mistake. You know, I, I did a career in finance. 
and then um, went off on my own with uh, with uh, with a trading company. Uh, we're doing futures and options. Um, it went uh, really great right off the bat, and then nothing after I quit my job uh, for a one year period. So we're we're on the edge of bankruptcy, and um, and decided to go ahead and add value to my investor list. So built up a list. Turns out I knew how to do some some advertising. Didn't know that that's what it was called back then. But I had a list of maybe 10, 15,000 investors and uh, and just started asking them, what do you want to know? I'm here to help. And they started providing this different information, uh, you know, in, in terms of what they wanted to learn. Because um, I learned through, you know, over 5,000 phone calls with these folks um, that they wanted to generate money so that they could fund their projects or, or things of this sort. So based on that, I created educational content myself and other partners who were experts within their field. Um, and at the end of it, I, I said, hey, by the way, if you love this, you'll love this course that was structured all around what they wanted to know that we would build with these partners and teach them on, on a six-week intensive. And then we did $17,864 that day, um, saved us from bankruptcy, which was amazing. And uh, never went under, thanks be to God, came close many times. Uh, but from there, people said, could you do that for us? That's how Irrational Marketing was born. So it was born by mistake. It started with clients. Um, and at which point there, my specialty was how to take somebody's knowledge, turn it into a curriculum and sell it um, using a, a product launch methodology uh, to go zero to a million dollars in sales as quickly as divinely possible. And uh, the record for that was two weeks uh, in 2015. But I, I, I was a one man army at that point. And uh, my mentor at the time said, listen, if you want to change the world, you have to lead people. You can't do this alone. You need a team. So started building a team in 2015. And then with Irrational Marketing, um, started seeing that people were having a really hard time um, in terms of growing their, their company. And, um, and then we became obsessed with how to deliver the result predictably. And um, because most of them would sign up for services or take a course or whatever it is. And, you know, 99% of the time they would fail. And so we ended up bringing that success rate up in terms of getting a funnel up, getting some traffic going, doing all that stuff um, with 67% uh, of people getting results within five days, which is crazy. But that came the, this, this new methodology of how to make sure that we're delivering on the service like a process and making sure that process is repeatable to produce the appropriate outputs, which is revenue lead sales. And um, so that, that was irrational marketing. And what we realized there is they would then say we, we were specializing in, in B2B uh, professional services. And then they're like, can you build us a website? We'd say yes, and then lose money. And then they're like, can, can you go ahead and do Facebook ads? We would say, no, but we have a partner that does. And then the partner would fail or there'd be an issue in terms of handing off the client and the, the customer relationship would fail. So if you can't build it and you can't partner for it, we said, let's buy it. And then that became the start of the Republic's journey to find the services that our customers were asking for and bringing those into the group so that they could have that seamless experience and then further productize those services for scale. So you have a rat irrational. Um, and it sounds like the first iteration was info products and, and teaching. And then people were asking you to do it for them. And then you started doing it for them. And that turned into an agency um, model. Um, and then the next piece is you were getting requests for these services you weren't doing. And you would say yes and try and do it, but maybe the capabilities weren't there. And then you partnered. You'd partner, but maybe that didn't work out. And then you started purchasing. So what was the first um, acquisition? So the first acquisition was LinkedIn to Leads because they they were doing a lot of uh, uh, 
LinkedIn lead generation. Um, and Was people, were people requesting that? Is that correct. okay? Yes, because we're very, very strong in email. So then opening up that additional social channel would create uh, a greater lift uh, for, for our customer base, right? And then following that was Golden Rule Growth that did the done for you LinkedIn campaigns um, in, in a way that was compliant with LinkedIn. So then it was the next logical step, right? So that's uh, that's kind of how it the the ball got rolling. So usually the first acquisitions I was making, first of anything that we're doing, it's kind of clunky. Like the process isn't worked out. What did you learn from the first acquisition with LinkedIn to leads that you then started to perfect more going forward? I think the the first acquisition was really around how to do things, how how to think outside the box without the constraints of how private equity says it should be done, how MBAs think it should be done, how conventional wisdom thinks it should be done. Um, Because, you know, oftentimes you don't have a large equity backer or the perfect environment to go ahead and do an acquisition. And um, so you need to think about it differently. So creative deal making uh, became uh, became important. And one of the things that I believe very strongly from the start was making sure that they shared um, in in Republic stock so that they wouldn't just you know, be acquired, but they would be part of the larger vision. Um, and that uh, that was something that we just kept on um, kept on pursuing. Can you just talk about for people a little bit about the structure of the deal itself? And you don't need to go into specifics. I'm sure all of them are a little bit different. But as far as cash, equity, stock, how was it structured um, when you you brought a company in to the Republic's platform? So it evolved over time, but like the typical structure is some cash up front, some sort of delayed consideration, either in the form of an earn out or um, a, a promissory note, and uh, and rollover equity into Republic stock. So just immediate gratification for them, for the seller, long-term gratification tied to uh, performance, and then... A uh, second bite at the apple based on the overall vision and what they were joining. Yeah, and then in most cases, I think I think the the founders stayed on. They didn't just go back and, and retire on a beach, right? Correct. Yeah, so they're on board. And then, how did you capitalize it? Did so, it change over time, like early? And I know I think you had said there was nine companies that were. Um, acquired under the kind of that Republic's uh, umbrella? So the the first couple were really done in, in a super creative way because we had no money. So, you know, it was a combination of, you know, lines of credit and um, primarily that. And then, uh, and then on a go forward, it was commercial debt. So using the, the, the big banks, uh, to go ahead and fund the the cash portion of the deals, and then in 2021, then we did a large corporate deal with the Bank of Montreal, where then they gave us uh, they they kind of refinanced all the all the debt, and uh, and provided us with a, an acquisition facility. So that's kind of been the evolution. What made you decide to? Um, like at this point in time, you're not actively looking for acquisitions. Correct. At what point did you decide, okay, we're good for now until later? Well, it's more, there's acquisition and then there's integration. And, you know, when when it comes to like a standard private equity model, which we're not, it's acquire a bunch of stuff based on your size, you're worth more, and then you go ahead and sell that or or, or take it public, right? But for us, in terms of having an integrated model, where all of these services are available on one centralized platform uh, to be able to deliver seamlessly to people, it's not a normal rollup. It's not. It's just we found the most effective way to get those services is through acquisition because building and partnering for it didn't work, 
right? So it's more acquisitions was a tool to build the vision instead of the business model itself. And then what we were realizing was, uh, what I realized was that I really needed to go ahead and dive into those respective operations, do the hard work of creating offers for the market that were performance-based or value-driven that took the best pieces of each of these different agencies and package them in a way that was meaningful for the customer, right? And so that takes time. And for example, like one of our companies, we acquired them for like one and a half million dollars. I, I, they were doing one and a half million dollars worth of revenue and uh, very specialized in the dental space. And just by reframing that offer and going out to market with very scalable lead generation, sales conversion processes and delivery processes, I would expect that particular offer to, to do anywhere between seven to ten million dollars worth of revenue next year so if you think about that like there's such latent power within each one of these businesses that we've acquired that um one we know how to do acquisitions clearly you know we 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 did 10 in two years that's that's ruthless okay we know how to do that the second portion is unlock the value that has been acquired Right, because that that ultimately is what de-risked the transaction and also the the whole acquisition thesis. Like, why did you buy this thing? Right now, we we had some failures, no doubt. We also had some big wins, right? And so this is an example of like how best to go ahead and look at different companies and be like, okay, do you have a very strong vertical expertise? And that goes kind of into acquisition criteria, even though we're not looking right now, we will be in the future, but it's like very strong vertical expertise. You know how to deliver predictable results in terms of revenue, sales for that particular vertical. Like you have a way of doing that and it works repeatedly, right? And then at the same time, like you, you ideally have some salespeople that have been able to convert that aren't the founder, right? That's also very, very important. Um, and usually a million dollars in EBITDA, right? Because when you're at a million in EBITDA, you have some degree of systems, right? So when we look at that situation, then um, we could take a company like that and probably five to 10 exit within a one to two year period. And that is a great acquisition thesis. I'd love for you to expand a little bit on that, the acquisition criteria. Um if there's anything else that you typically look for, you mentioned the vertical expertise, predictability of results for the clients, salespeople, or just, you know, a good team in place, um, e you know, 1 million EBITDA, which, you know, you said relates to systems or any other criteria that you were looking for. Like, ideally, they have a management team that is not the founder that uh, that is operating the business, because that means there's been a proper knowledge transfer from the founder that got procedurized and that somebody who's not them can uh, do that work. And um, especially in this sort of a business, like it's all around the process that you have um, around the management and the delivery of, uh, of your services, right? So that's, uh, that's also a plus. I know we learn from our failures sometimes more than our successes. So I love to talk about what were some of the learnings from the failures? But it's interesting, you know, Thomas, I wasn't expecting to go on this call to say you were you were not acquiring companies anymore. Because if you look at it, you've done, in a couple of years, you've grown over $30 million, right? Um, let's say from my research is over $10 million in EBITDA. When you would acquire a company, I'm 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 curious about the valuation piece, but like if you acquire a company one or two times, when they come into you, they're immediately without doing anything worth a larger multiple than what you bought them for, right? So I'm like, why is he stopping acquisitions? But maybe it's a debt thing. I don't know. So the, there's also the the challenges from a debt market standpoint, there's no doubt, right? In terms of interest rates rising and otherwise. The other aspect is that like our industry as a whole has been in recession for five quarters. 
So there's contraction of revenue. There's pressure at the level of marketing budgets. Um, some of our sub-segments, especially in the direct-to-consumer uh, market, they're not hitting their numbers um, and therefore they're getting, they're, they're entering restructuring phases and otherwise. So just from a macro environment standpoint, it's just like we, we have to go ahead and see how can we maximize what we have, right? Because then adding more things just increases the complexity of what needs to be solved. So I, I often like it's tattooed on my back. A difficulty is nothing more than an opportunity. So as these difficulties came in, we said, what are the fundamental things that we need to go ahead and focus further on? Customer retention, the onboarding experience, the customer experience, um, going to the market value base instead of commoditize. Because like we were on an up market. It's very, very easy to sell when everything's going great. But when things are, are choppy and the environment is tough, if you're still selling and converting at a high rate, then you know you have a strong value-based offer because people are willing to part with their money based on the value that you're delivering. So it really forced us to shift our offers um, much closer to the vision uh, of Republics of this, this hassle-free and, uh, and predictable revenue one-stop shop. Um, and we said, okay, well, let's, let's do the hard work and once that hard work is complete, then when we acquire, then we're going to be extremely successful. Because you're right, you know, on let's say we buy them three, four times, and then you're worth 10 times. Let's just say automatically you've two and a half X your, your, your equity value or your enterprise value, right? Because there's still debt. But if now we said, well, it's not only that, but now we can actually 10 X what those uh, that EBITDA was, now you you've created you know 1.25 orders of magnitude return. That that is insane, right? 25 times return on that initial thing, and when your cash outlay is zero, that that's beyond an undetermined return. So it's more we figured out the front. Great, we're good at that. Let's figure out the back. And funny enough, by having that shift in perspective, it, it actually changed um, our acquisition criteria. Because if, if you, you know, if we look at the previous model, and because it's very easy as, as human beings, we like to take the easy route. It's funny that the easy route is do 10 acquisitions in two years. But the easy route is like, oh, let's just do this thing and look great. We we generated another $20 million worth of equity value. Let's do it again and again and again. The lens there is financial. If we take the lens of the customer at the center and saying, how do we make that customer win? And the goal then is market penetration and market share and share of wallet, which only comes if you're delivering value to the market. If not, they won't expand. The customer won't expand with you then suddenly the acquisition criteria is, it's actually not about the financial aspect. It's how, how good is that market? How productized are you? How scalable is that solution? How predictable is that revenue? I, I mean, the, the results for the customer, the revenue for the customer. Okay, great, let's scale that. Because what happens there, like that example, like $1.5 million company doing 400,000 in EBITDA, going to let's say seven million dollars worth of revenue at like three million in EBITDA, that return of let's say 10, 12x is far greater than the two and a half times arbitrage that we had from going from a you know, just just the multiple arbitrage. Not only that, but we still get the multiple arbitrage on on that extra two and a half million dollars of EBITDA we generated. So it's a it's a it's a triple bite at the apple, but you got to know what you're doing, and for that it requires like the proper systems, the right kind of team, the right integration process, and knowing how to unlock that value. So that shifted our focus. The other thing is we don't need you to be two million in EBITDA. Technically, we could buy a break-even business that knows how to generate great revenues for their client. We pay nothing for it, zero risk, and then scale it to three million in EBITDA. 
Okay, well, that's even less risky than anything else. So just, just some interesting thoughts that have come from that shift in perspective by saying, we're not going to do this thing we're amazing at anymore. We're going to focus on this thing that we're terrible at. It wasn't terrible. We, st- I mean, we just from cross sales with the, with what I was calling terrible was twenty percent of our revenues last year. But we could just be so much better if we really got diligent on that, because then there's nothing stopping us from doing an acquisition a week. So sometimes we got to take a step back to build the infrastructure to be able to sprint forward. Right. And a bunch of people would say, You were sprinting at 10 acquisitions in two years. I say, No, Apple does one a week. So we got a long ways to go, but you need to be able to digest that and unlock the value. Right. And unlocking the value comes by unlocking more value for more customers of that thing you're acquiring. Talk about the evolution of the agency valuations a little bit. Um, I also want to point out what you said. I did an interview with Sujan Patel, who started Mailshake. Um, I don't know. I think when we talked, they have like 70,000 customers. But he was doing acquisitions, and he was talking about this. Um, the integration's tough. And they gave at least six months per acquisition for integration alone and it was not easy so you you guys are on hyperspeed there but um talk about valuation because you're talking to a founder right it's their baby there's an emotion piece you're looking at just here's the criteria here's the financials but when you're talking to a founder it's a little bit different conversation sometimes they have you'll tell me um inflated view of how much their company's worth potentially Correct. I don't know if you found that. What was what? How did those conversations go? And um, it, it's kind of a valuation piece. Um, what have you seen with the the evolution of the valuation and that that conversation with founders? So um, it starts by being really clear where you have to say no. So our underwriting model is very clear. We know where the valuation needs to be in order for them to get their money, right? We also have the benefit of, of, you know, having an acquisition facility with BMO when we decide to go ahead and start start acquiring again. So there's there's also the monies there. So it, number one is like understanding what is your model because you can't lose. Acquisitions are risky. Okay, so that's number one. So if I'm very, very clear in terms of what we could pay, you can choose to say yes or no. And if you say no and uh, if it's close, we can have a conversation. If it's like, I need 8X and you're doing 400,000 NIBIDA, next, there's 14,000 agencies, 95 business, or 95% of businesses don't sell. And so it's also an internal recognition that in that conversation, I am the valuable one. Now, I don't say that out of pride. It's from a negotiating standpoint. It's like you will not find somebody else that can action on this deal and actually get the deal done. Right? So on like 13 LOIs, we close 10 deals. That's a really, really high hit rate. So it's like, do you choose the hit rate and the money is there and this is how it's going to work? And by the way, this is how you get a second bite at the apple. If that works for you, great. And if it doesn't, next, because there's another one of you, right? So that's what I learned. I was I was emotionally attached to a few and I was like, no. And that that's where, you know, um, having, having proper mentorship at, the, at those levels, I think is important. We'll talk about mentorship in a second, but um, back to the failures piece. What did you learn from some of the failures that you brought in to the acquisitions going forward? So, and they don't just tie to acquisitions. Like there, there were many, many uh, things that I would do differently now, but I'm grateful for 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 what happened because it it built me to who I am today. From from an an acquisition standpoint, really making sure 
that um, the revenue is recurring and that the contracts are strong. We got our asses kicked on a couple because of that. The other aspect, like is, there wasn't recurring revenue there. They had a good. But it wasn't. We didn't dig deep enough. Right. The other one is when uh, the founder or the founders are responsible for sales and have a lack of process with regards to to managing their companies. Well, that bit us a couple times too. Right. So those those are some of the learnings there. But I think the the biggest learning is at the level of governance. Like we set a board up right off the bat. And it's important that that board be aligned with your values and what it is that you're looking to create. That running a business is really hard. And so having supportive people that are honest, that will tell you the bad news, that provide the critical feedback, but do it in a kind way is is important, right? And um, and that I think is probably the most important because the board represents the shareholders. and um, and it's important that if you're the founder of that company and you're the majority shareholder that you control that board. And I didn't. And so that became very problematic and uh, and ended up, forcing a shift in strategy um, at a time that it was the wrong move, right? It was the wrong move because nobody knows the business more than the CEO. Nobody. Nobody has more information about the business, is more in tune with what needs to be done. And ultimately, and this is something that I learned from our current chairman and mentor, Yuri Levine, uh, who, uh, you know, he was the co-founder and CEO of Waze the traffic navigation up. Yeah. I think they sold for over a billion dollars to Google. Yeah, like 1.1 billion. And then he did it again with Move It and they sold to Intel for a billion. Like he's just a unicorn minter, right? And um, and at the end of the day, um, it, it, it's just it's just really, really important to, to, to have the right people surrounding you from a mentorship standpoint and, um, and just really... Um, um, really supporting you because the CEO's job is the hardest job. It just is, right? There's so many variables, there's incomplete information and you need to make decisive decisions on a very consistent basis because it's life or death for the company, right? So talk about some of the mentors and a lesson or advice I gave you and maybe we could work in reverse order because when I when I go back to the Thomas, uh, the one man army Thomas, I'm sure mm-hmm. there were different mentors, either actual personal mentors or distant mentors then than there are now. But let's go reverse. Like now, some of your board members, some of the advice they gave you. Um, start with Yuri. Man, Yuri's just incredible. Um, How did you get in touch with Yuri in the first place? I met him at an investor roundtable uh, with YPO, which is a, a global organization I'm part of, Young Presidents Organization, one of the best things I've ever done. And uh, and he was presenting, and I was just asking him a bunch of questions about business, and otherwise, we just ended up having a great conversation. And I was like, hey, we should do something. He's like, if I can add value, I'd love to be a part of it. And, um, and he's just been incredible. So the, the lessons from Yuri, there's just so many, you know, like one of them is put the customer and their problem at the center of your universe. So that, that's been life-changing for me. Um, the other thing more from a CEO standpoint is that, um, how to go ahead and deliver like tough news and um, and feedback in a way that is constructive. He just does such a great job at that and just seeing him operate um, is incredible. He also forces me to celebrate our wins, 
like, hey, take a moment. That's awesome. Like you're you're not you're you're not taking enough time on that. And bring that to your team, right? So yeah, mm-hmm. Yuri, Yuri's really been at the level of like leadership and and also like a holistic way of looking at the business uh in a very pragmatic way uh to, to drive results. Prior to that, um, another life-changing mentor was Dan Pena. And the I think the the biggest uh there, there's a few different lessons there, but one of them is that concept of next that I brought up earlier. He was the one that taught me that. He also taught me everything I know about MA. So and that was very, very uh, helpful. Um, and at the same time, to be harder. But there's a distinction between being hard. You can be hard and demanding of people and kind. And being hard and demanding and an asshole. Right? There's a distinction. And you'll see a lot of leaders out there. They're trying to wrestle with this situation. Right? But being hard and demanding of my people, because I was leaning on being too nice and wanting to be liked. That's one of the things like, um, as a CEO, it's not about being liked, it's about doing the right thing and holding your people to a high standard. And I choose to do that through building them up, coaching, giving them proper feedback on it, holding them to account. Um, and ultimately, you know, if they don't perform, then it's, uh, it's the conversation that needs to be had. And then you, my job is to have the best team on the bench at any given time. Um, but doing that with kindness, I think really matters. And prior to that, another critical mentor for me was Offer Breyer. Um, and uh, he, he, so he's an Israeli. He was a top transformational consultant for Briar Group, Disney, Nike, whatever, and he never went to school. Then he revolutionized the education system in the Czech Republic, was brought into Singapore's education system to go ahead and work on that. He worked on Elon Musk school. So he's a teacher at heart, um, jazz pianist, martial artist, like just an incredible human being that dove really, really deep at the level of how learning occurs and how to transfer knowledge from one individual to another and how to go ahead and, and bring maximal effectiveness and efficiency in a human being. So he became a mentor. I met him through an event. Everybody was clamoring around. And then we went out for dinner in Chicago, funny enough. And um, and he's like, I'll work with you. And then what, what I did with all of my mentors is I, I was always the best student. Right. I was Dan's best student. I, I, I'm Yuri's um, best student. I'm, you know, offers best student because they uh, a mentor loves a great student. Right. Maybe I'm not the best on on some of these, but but they're just like, man, this guy's just doing everything. I tell fast. And they love that. And so the mentor then gives so much more. You know, like I wasn't paying off of. He was getting paid $1,000 an hour. I paid him nothing. And he loved speaking with me, still does. So, um, and so the thing that he showed me is that all technology is a methodology. And the key at the level of delivering results is a predictable process. So, and that was transformative in terms of the thesis of republics. Right, which is turning a service into a repeatable methodology, which can which can now be tech enabled for for massive scale, and how to produce that result in the end. So, I would say those have been like the most critical uh, mentors um, from a business standpoint. And on a spiritual side, I had a guru, and um, who initiated me in Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity taught me meditation, breathing exercises, concentration, like really, really working on my spiritual self at a whole other level that was extremely scientific and that who I am impacts everything I do. So for me, tapping into this source is a critical area of my inspiration, strength, and everything that I do. 
So Guruji was instrumental in transforming my, uh, helping me with a predictable methodology to transform uh, my being. So yeah, those are just a few, but man, I've had Talk a lot. about Jason Swank for a second, his role and um, influence. So Jason Swank's fucking awesome. Because <laughs> uh, funny enough, it was his agency blueprint that helped Irrational procedurize a lot of its operations to scale to the next level. So that's how I got introduced to Jason. And when I created Republics uh, with my co-founder, Nico, I reached out to him like, hey, Jason, we're about to do this thing. It's crazy. This is what we're going to do. We have nothing right now. I'd love for you to be on my board. And so we had an advisory board then, and he's still active now. And uh, he's like, yeah, well, I'll come in on this. Let's do it. And um, so, and Jason's just a very kind and practical person, and he's extremely efficient. What he does with an hour and how he goes ahead and compartmentalizes his priorities in his life, um, I, I highly respect. You know, he's a great marketer. He's a great business leader. He knows how to create product. Um, but also, he's just like a really great and kind sounding board, always there to support. You know, we have a few more minutes. Uh, I can go on for hours with this, um, Thomas. Based, uh, there's a lot to unpack here, but I, I do want to highlight a little bit more about what you do as a company. Um, and I don't know if we should talk about the IT services one, the R and D tax one. Uh, which one would be better to to talk through and what you did? Gotcha. So I mean, there's so in terms of like examples of work that we've done and the type of results. Yeah, like for example, there's an IT services company, um, uh, you know, selling to the mid market, helped them generate over three million in sales in a six month period. Uh, there's an R and D tax credit professional services company um, that was coming into Canada at that time, so they had no presence here. So we took them zero to five million dollars in pipeline in six months, and then they ended up closing a few million dollars worth of business out of that. Um, Talk about the IT services for a second. What were some of the levers you had to pull to go from zero to three million? So we the tactics that were used within our ecosystem: email, LinkedIn, video, uh, targeted calling, an event-based methodology to go ahead and bring those individuals in one centralized event, um, and automation, marketing automation. So that was that one. So you see, it's these combinations of these different, what we call SKUs, kind of like inventory SKUs that were pulled together to deliver a, um, a result. Love it. Um, Thomas, last question. And before I ask it, I just want to point people to um, check out more, learn more, republics.com. That's R E P U B L I X.com. Are there any other places online we should point people towards to check? Uh, to learn more um that that's a great place to start we we it's funny our website is always the the lagging indicator of what we're doing so that's reflective of who we were maybe two years ago um but as you know as, as we're looking at these things i i would say come on my linkedin connect with me and um and then and then from that standpoint more than happy to have a conversation um, there's also, you know, different interviews and otherwise that, uh, that I've done here over the last little bit and uh, that go into our methodology and, and otherwise, but, uh, but yeah. Last question, Thomas is just, um, you're obviously a voracious learner soaking up from mentors books. I'm just, um, curious, some of your favorite, um, resources and books, uh, it could be leadership business. What are some of your favorites? One of my favorite books is The One Thing by Gary Keller. He founded Keller Williams, and um, and he goes into a methodology to prioritize your life and how best to go ahead and focus for uncommon results. Um, that, that book's been a game changer for me. I, I recommend it all the time. Um, uh, another one is actually Alex Harmozy, and uh, he came out with a, a book called $100 Million Offers. And um, and he just did such a great job on that, how to create a brain dead offer that people would feel stupid saying no to. 
Um, and it's just very rare to find people who are speaking from experience and not just peddling their wares and the only thing they know how to make money on is selling you how to do something that they've only done it by selling it to you, right? That's not a thing. That That's just like charlatan stuff, right? But the people that are practically in the trenches, getting the work done, producing the results, always testing, evolving, I, I really respect those folks. Um, so that that's been a really great book um a winner's dream by uh um uh, by bill mcdermott ceo of service now was the ceo of sap um and uh just a tremendous book of like a very strong leader um that um who leads with decisiveness takes no nonsense and is just kind He's just a good man and uh, really respect him and love his story. It's a great story. Oh, last one, Phil Knight, Shoe Dog. Such a great book. It's I feel just, like that's, um, oh. uh, I, I call it a kind of entrepreneurial therapy. In a yeah, sense. It's, yeah. It's, it's amazing because he's so candid and vulnerable as he's going through his story. And it's fascinating. Um, so yeah, I, those are just a few off the top of my head. Thomas, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone ch check out republics.com. Learn more. Thomas, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Thanks for having me here. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, nice like a beach if you find the sailing right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.